criteria for acceptance and for basically conduct, if you will, within the country. And they made it clear that Burma is not uh, 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 acting lawfully, acting within any uh, acceptable uh, parameters. They didn't cite Cambodia, but uh, perhaps they should consider this because uh, this is a group to which I, I think all of the participating nations want to be not only uh, included but uh, respected within that group. And there, there is clear violations of the principles that the ASEAN countries uh, identify. Uh, now, I appreciate uh, uh, the, the Vice Chair, Mr. Wolf's uh, uh, passionate prioritization of human rights. Uh, unfortunately, it was not shared by the, uh, the, the last administration. Uh, I think we're going to see a whole new approach to human rights. And in fact, uh, I know Secretary of State Clinton has made this a priority. And I would, I, I, in fact, I, I'm not surprised if you're working with Ms. Black that you are probably going to be meeting with the Secretary of State. Is that the case? I, have, I have met with the highest level at the State Department already yesterday. Thank you. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank
and the and Paul Potts Army have still been allowed to function. Is there any relationship uh, with regard to the military's activities, uh, their, uh, their attitude toward the people, and the impunity with which they act, and uh, the past history where uh, uh, I know what occurred has been condemned, but not particularly punished. Uh, could you address that just briefly? Yes, Congressman um, Moran. Um, there was an agreement with the, with the government of the, Khmer Rouge, the former Khmer Rouge uh, army to join as a part of the reconciliation process. And many of these high-ranking officials uh, with the army today of the Khmer Rouge. So some of the army, uh, and I assume they would be officers because they've got to be relatively old, but they were members of the Khmer Rouge. So they're still functioning in the army today? Yes. Are these some of the people who are particularly likely to uh, be abusive to the Cambodian people? You're talking about as um, Sophie Rick Richardson just said, uh, the records of these army officials, high-ranking officials on human rights. So I, I don't need to say more than that. Yeah. But what I can say is that these, uh, the, because of the level of impunity, the culture of impunity, it's very unlikely that these people will be touched by the rule of law. And on top of that, the agreement between the government and the UN on the Khmer Rouge trial is that um, a certain top number of um, top leaders in the Khmer Rouge um, regime uh, would go to the Khmerish trial. So unlikely these people will be uh, faced of uh, the Khmerish court. Thank you, Ms. Lu. Uh, uh, Dr. Richardson, uh, it just occurs to me that, that if we were to proceed with cutting off, uh, I assume it's foreign military financing that they're getting, FMF funds. Yeah. Is that well, if we were to proceed cutting off those funds, that might be one explanation. If there is still Khmer Rouge elements in that military, the U.S. has no business providing any resources whatsoever to that military. And now, is that the case, Dr. Certainly, there are former Khmer Rouge in the current military, but there are also dozens of them in the government. Yeah. I mean, you know. Secretary Clinton will, in 10 days, go to New York to UNGA and presumably will meet with Cambodia's foreign minister, who is himself a former member of the Khmer Rouge, so it's the prime minister. I mean, they are shot through the government and, and you know, the whole power establishment. I, I want to be very clear, and my, my, my concern about FMF is that, and, and, and whether it should be cut, I think there are a lot of tough questions that require some very clear answers. Um, but if, if the evidence or the answers are as, as damning as I think they could be, then yes, that is an appropriate response. May I respond really quickly to a couple of the points that you made a few minutes ago? Uh, first of all, about the 2008 elections. Uh, uh, I think the, from a human rights perspective, the way you would think about an election is not just a question of the technical aspects of it and whether everyone who should have been able to vote was able to cast a ballot. But I think it's also the element of, a, of, of uncertainty. You have to be able to conceive that the ruling power, that the ruling party would, could lose and would step aside. And, and in that, that was inconceivable going into the, two, into the 2008 elections, partly because of what had come before in other elections. Uh, I mean, it is, it is hypothetically possible that the Cambodian People's Party enjoyed genuine and non-coerced uh, political support of such a magnitude that it could have won, but even that, even that security was not enough to keep, uh, to prevent there being serious problems. And so I think it can't just be viewed sort of in, in that slice of 2008 itself. But also with respect to uh, the, the Cambodia isn't Burma, um, you know, in, in some ways I think the CPP has benefited enormously from its neighbors. Uh, you know, because they're, they're not quite as bad as some of them, but that's not good enough. And two of the historical precedents that I think are very important to recall are not just the 1991 Paris Peace Agreements, which set out a Cambodia that remains so distant from where we are now, you know, many, many, many years later, 
but also entails obligations on the part of the United States and other